Welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast with your host, Johnny Gorky. You have the power to overcome challenges and fears. Let my voice and the voice of many others show you how to transform these challenges into opportunities. To learn more about future podcasts and read episode show notes, check out my website at www.thepowerofyourvoice.com. Welcome back to another exciting podcast episode. Thank you for joining us today. I'm super excited about our next guest for episode 34. Today's guest is Dr. Grace Lee. She's not a typical brain and behavior expert with a PhD in neuroscience. Rather, she's a career educator, quantum leap accelerator, and strategic reinventist on a mission to end the separation between work and fulfillment. To that end, she is building a global mass movement called Career Revisionist, a term she created to represent an identity of empowered individuals resolved to feel inspired by what they do. Careers are built much like a business is built. And Dr. Grace believes that a great career is built like a great business using proven principles of business development. An educator focused on excellence, Dr. Grace has said no matter what your educational or vocational background, behind every success there is an mountains of obstacles and an ocean of unfavorable odds. Everything looks like a failure halfway through. Progress often disguised itself as problems when in fact it is evidence of growth and improvement. With a 10-year background helping professionals reinvent their careers, Dr. Grace has a deep empathy for those very humble beginnings. Her personal journey from being orphaned and then homeless at the age of nine provided the backdrop for her to develop resilience and resourcefulness to survive. After a serendipitous meeting with an older couple who would later become her adoptive parents, Dr. Grace found that her story was resonating, especially how she levered education as her ticket to freedom. Today, Dr. Grace helps professionals to reinvent their careers through her coaching and her programs that are rooted in neuroscience. Her clients learn to discover their purpose, decide on career direction, build their dream career, and grow their income. She shares her knowledge, experience, and story of resilience on her YouTube channel, her career revisionist podcast, and as an international speaker, she envisions a world where everyone is resolved to create their own destiny by building a career in the life of their dreams. Dr. Grace, welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast. I'm so great to have you here today. I'm blessed to be here. Thanks for the invitation. You are so welcome. So first question I wanted to really ask, because this is something I just learned about you. So I hear you enjoy racing cars and you drive a Nissan 370Z 6MT. That's a long name. How did you get into racing? It's interesting. <laughs> um, I, I didn't always know that I liked cars, but I always had this fascination. It began with BMWs. And what happened was in between my degrees, two, in between two of my degrees, I was working a, a summer job and I worked at a garage. It was a BMW garage and I was, I was helping, I, went, I was a mechanics assistant and I was also the office assistant and it was a used BMW. It wasn't like a, the dealership. And so that's what really got me fascinated about cars. And at that time, I'm a student. I didn't have money to buy a car. I didn't own a car, but I told myself someday, my first car is going to be a sports car because I like speed. I like, you know, I'm, a, I'm an adrenaline junkie. And then I did. I, my first car is the 376 manual, 6MT is six manual transmission. So it is a, is a standard vehicle. Nice. And yeah. So I purchased it and I was like, yes, my dream come true. This is my first car. My dream come true. It's a sports car. It's a two seer sports car. And then of course, in the city, you just don't have opportunities to really see the car perform. And then I, and then that's when I started seeking out opportunities to put it on the track and race it on the track. And that's how it really got started. <laughs> that is so sweet. Yeah. Cause I'm sure as a n neuroscientist, I'm sure a lot of people probably don't know that about you, that you like racing cars. 
No, they don't. It's not the first question I get asked. That's sure. <laughs> and how long have you been doing this? So the car is a 2012. So 2012 until now. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. That is so sweet. Okay. So now I'm going to shift into the more serious question. Dr. Grace, usually people assume that a person, you know, you your doctor, maybe both of your parents were, because I, I have a few friends who are doctors, and usually they become doctors because they're parents. Now, this was not your experience. So can you share with us today what happened to you when you were nine years old? Ah, the, yes, that, what, that's what seeded my interest in neuroscience. So on my, actually it was the day before my ninth birthday, I was involved in a car accident. And my whole family was in there. So my parents, my brother and I were in that vehicle. And it was a high speed head on collision. My mom passed away from that accident and it was a severe brain trauma. And I myself, I had the second worst injuries and it was a cervical. So in my neck, I basically broke my neck where I had two vertebrae that were dislocated. There were some fractures in there as well. And I was really close. I remember that the, the doctor's um, the doctor's report when he walked into the room, he, he said that I was really close to never being able to move my legs and arms again. Oh my God. Yeah. But now that on retrospect, I understand the medical implications a little bit more. Basically, I would have ended up as a quadriplegic and dependent on a respirator for the rest of my life. And I was so close to that. So well, when we taken together, my mom's brain trauma, myself, my near spinal cord injury, that's what really planted a seed that I was interested in neuroscience because back then there was so little known about the central nervous system and the brain and there still is. So I wanted to just to help patients like that and families who've been affected by trauma and injury. Wow. That's very interesting. So watching your video, your father, he kind of left. What, what, what happened there? Right. So my biological father, he didn't, it's not that he left. It was that, so when my mom died, I was in the hospital for quite a few, several, several months bedridden. And, you know, I had that halo brace. And if you don't know what that is, it's like a, it's like a ring, like a halo, an angel's halo around your head, but they're held by pins that go through your head. And I so see I this. had, yeah, yeah. I've had it for, I had it for months in, in that year that of my injury. And so there was a long recovery, but I did, eventually I recovered. And then there was physio, there's rehabilitation. And in that process, a year later, my dad remarried, right? He remarried and he had a couple of kids from that new marriage. And basically it is not that he left. He, he came into my room and he told me that he was unable to care for me because he has a family now, you know, he has his kids now and there was a lot of responsibilities and he was unable to care for me. And that was the day that I had to leave the house, right? So that was, that's what happened. I, I actually was the one that uh, had to leave the, the home, but he didn't, he didn't leave the family, if that makes sense. Wow. That's yeah, definitely something that a child should not have to go through. Yeah, it was, um, it was the second life-changing moment for me at the age of 10, nine and 10, two years in a row. It was like two really big blows in my life and really and each of those had such very different very dynamic impacts for me in my future so at the at the time i remember hearing so you were working in a restaurant where were you living at that time so it's interesting so okay so my family and i are originally from hong kong but we made our way into canada and that's i'm based in canada right now for in a different city but at the time of the car accident and at the time of being kind of like being asked to leave the home, you know, I guess it was an awkward type of homelessness that began for me. At that time, we were based in the prairie provinces of Canada. So one of the prairie provinces in, in a rural village, not in an urban center, not in a metropolis. It was in a, in a village in the prairie provinces. So it's kind of like the country. Yeah, I, uh, but not when you think of country, you kind of think of like cowboy, you know, American, <laughs> American Western town. It wasn't. It wasn't like that. It was more like little house on the prairies. You know, I don't know how to describe it. If you've seen that, if you, if you understand my reference to little house on the prairie, <laughs> <laughs> like Amish. <laughs> there are Amish um, communities in the vicinity, but I didn't live in one. 
but it was it was very much a prairie scene. Okay, so when your father asked you to leave, where'd you go? <sighs> Anywhere and nowhere at the same time. Kind of like finding, I was very, it, it really did invoke this creative side of me. You know, I was in school, yeah, I was in elementary school. So there were times where I was successful at making excuses to be at a friend's house and then just kind of like saying, oh, I need to crash. It's too late to go home. I need to crash on your sofa or something like that. So I, I, I was able to get by in that regard. And sometimes it would just be running anywhere, you know, just outside that I could find. Like it was, it was, it was the lowest and darkest moment of my life. And how exactly did you overcome that? Because at such a young age, like you, you hear these stories where people are teenagers, but my gosh, you're like nine, 10 years old. Yeah, I, I barely, I'd have to say I didn't handle it well and I didn't handle it. Yeah, I, I checked out. It was like, I gave up on life and every day was like, this thought in my head every day, every moment of every day, I thought, you know, I think I could just die right now. No one would know and no one would care. And that was just the, um, the utter aloneness of feeling like the unwanted one, like the forgotten one in this world. And really that was the only thing I could think of. It occupied all the days, all the minutes of my life. It was just a very dark moment. Yeah. Now leading up from then till you were what 14 years old and you started working in a restaurant no i started working there when i was 11. oh wow yeah 11 and it was really one of those things where you don't understand it at the time and you don't really want to do anything you know i was just i checked out i get i'd I'd given up on life but you just go through these motions it's like a default pattern you don't even you're just like floating through the days and you just it's every day is just, you have no idea why you're here. And you, I just feel like I felt so unwanted. I have no idea why I'm here. But in working in the restaurant, what that gave me was opportunities to observe people and to see the goodness in people. Whereas where I felt that nobody cared, nobody wanted me. There were these customers who came through that I've had very meaningful conversations with. You know, at the, at the age of 11, people are curious, you know, why are you working here? You know, so that's what I mean. It really gave me opportunities to, to talk to people like that. And it was one, so 14 was the key moment because that was when I met that couple who came into my life. And yeah, that, that couple who, they, complete strangers, they came to the restaurant, they were dining. I settled, when they settled their bill, they were very astute and they looked at me and they realized I needed a place to stay. And that was when they, they opened up their hearts and they said to me, Grace, if you need a place to stay, why don't you come live with us? Just like that. And so that night, I, I just quickly finished my shift and I followed them home. Everything I owned was in a backpack and I followed them home and that was it. Complete strangers. And it was the thing, it was very risky. You, you know, you should never follow strangers home. It was very risky, but I was desperate. I was just completely desperate. And this was a way for me to say, okay, if this is an opportunity for me, I'll take it. You know, anything that, any crumbs that people could give me, I would take it, you know. So I, I followed them home that night. And those are, that's the couple that ended up adopting me. The interesting thing is, I remember hearing, so for a while, you didn't trust them. No, I didn't trust them. Now, how are you able to, to shift that where you're able to trust? Because a lot of times, yeah, I mean, just think about a child who might be in a foster home or maybe eventually they get adopted and they're going in and out of homes. And yeah, it's like you don't know how long you're going to be there and you don't know these people. How are you able to shift your mind until you were able to like, you know what? These people really do love and care about me. They support me. They really want the best for me. How are you able to shift that, that thought process? I hear, well, when you're 14, you don't know much about shifting thought processes and you don't know that you can do that. So I definitely, I, I didn't have a lot of self-awareness at that age. Uh, but for me, I mean, I didn't go through orphanage. Like I, I just slipped under the table and no one knew. No one knew about my situation and no one knew to call family services or any government official. There was nothing like that. I was completely on my own. And so, and I understand that when children do go through foster care, there is, there are trust issues and children have difficulties jumping from home to home. Although that wasn't my situation, 
knowing that I had been sort of like abandoned before, you know, so then when my foster parents went, well, my, my parents, they took me into their home, these strangers, right? I didn't trust that they were the real deal. I didn't trust that they were sincere about it, right? It was like, okay, well, sooner or later, they're going to ask me to leave. You know, that was my, that was my mode, my attitude at the time, you know, sooner or later, I don't know how long I get to stay here. Sooner or later, they're going to ask me to leave. I'm going to be out again. I'm going to be on the street again. So then um, I didn't trust them. And it was just that because I didn't trust them, that's why I didn't feel comfortable developing any relationship with them. You know, I keeping them at arm's length, you know, to protect myself from getting hurt. Yeah. Well, I, I guess too, thinking about what from when 14 to 16, once you were 16, you realize, and the, probably the big thing is that they were very consistent with the way they treated you. Oh, very much so. So it wasn't me shifting it. It was just an just this epiphany. Two years later, when I was 16, I was in the bedroom and they put me in a bedroom on the top floor. It was incredible. It was the biggest bedroom I've ever seen. Double bed, which was the biggest bed I've ever seen. And all the walls were yellow. And one morning I woke up to the sound of my dad. I, well, I call them mom and dad now because they're like, they're my parents, right? So one, one morning I woke up to my, the sound of my dad's voice and, and the walls were very thin. And he was talking outside to a neighbor. And there's a window in, my, in, the, in the bedroom. So I went out and I looked and I saw him there standing, talking to the neighbor. And I could hear what he was saying. And the sound of his voice, he sounded just so sincere talking to that neighbor. So raw, so vulnerable, so sincere. And it was in that moment where I had the aha moment. It was where that was the defining moment where I realized this couple is the real deal. They meant what they said. They are sincere and I trusted them. And that was where, you know, you had that, you know, tears of, of gratitude. That's where that happened. You know, as tears just started rolling down my face, tears of gratitude. And I felt such warmth and compassion for them. And that's when I realized that, you know, I have to be responsible for the rest of my life. They've given me a second chance. This is my second chance. I don't want to give up on life anymore. And I, ha but no one is going to care, support me financially. No one's going to support me beyond this. I have to be independent. So that's when I made the choice that my education was going to be the ticket to the freedom I wanted in my life. That's beautiful. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, you just had to show up. You went to work that particular day and they happened to just be there, but you had to talk to them. I mean, it's amazing how all that kind of stuff, because like, just imagine had you not at work that day or you were sick or something. It's like things would have been completely different. I, I guess so. It's interesting. I, it's working, yes, but I didn't get paid for it. Like I didn't get paid a salary for it. I was allowed to eat the food. I was allowed to eat. So I, I, I took that as payment because otherwise I wouldn't be able to sustain myself. But I quickly learned, and this was like an entrepreneurial me, I guess. I quickly learned that as a waitress, I can get tip money. And so my motivation was earning a dollar a day or $2 a day because of the tips that customers give if you treat them well. And so I treated everyone well, not just because I wanted money from them, but because I knew that every dollar could make a difference in my future. Although I had no idea, I couldn't even see the future. So the purpose of my life in those years was just to collect a dollar every day and that was the purpose of my life. And I couldn't see why I was doing it. <laughs> wow. So that you were actually working there in exchange for food? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it, was, it was like a comfort zone as well, a place to go. You know, we all need somewhere to go, somewhere to feel like we have a purpose. And I wasn't working. I, I was a minor. I started working at 11, right? So I, I was a minor. And it, for me, it was a place to go where people come in and they're strangers. They don't know about my life, you know, and I could just be. And I could just talk to people and escape the problems in my life, you know, escape the aloneness in my life because I'm surrounded by these customers who come in and, and want to talk to me. Right. So it gave me that as well. It gave me that comfort. It gave me a sense of purpose, even though I didn't believe that I could have a future. That's the beautiful thing about working in service too. Cause when I was in school, I bartended for seven years and it is really for anybody who's young listening to this, definitely invite you to work in 
a restaurant or something because the people that you meet, the conversations, the friendships you can gain is just incredible. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. And when you are in service to other people, that's where you feel fulfilled. You know, it's what it's a spiritual need we have as human beings, the desire to make a meaningful contribution in the world. And that contribution is really in service to others. I mean, there was a quote, a beautiful quote that I love from Zig Ziglar. And he said that you could have anything you want in your life if you, have an, if you help enough people get what they want, right? And so that's like a service-based business. It doesn't mean that you have to be, you're stuck to being a waitress or, or a customer service rep for the rest of your life, but just being of service to others is what brings fulfillment. Yeah, it's very, very true. And that's a really good quote. For somebody who might be listening to this, who might be a foster parent, or maybe they're adopted parents, and maybe they're going through that experience that you were going through at that time, what is something that you might say to them that, okay, well, I have this young child in my house. I don't think they trust me. Maybe they don't like me but my intentions are pure. I really love this child. I really want the best. And I really want to help empower them and change their life. And I want to be that person that can really help them. What is something that you would say to that parent? I would say that one of the most important things that you could do is to give that child space to grow, space to discover themselves and space to discover what's true and what's not true in their life. I mean, you're as a foster parent, you're basically like leaders in their lives. They're going to be watching you. They're going to be listening to you, even though you might not know it and they might not admit it, but they're going to, they're observing and they're used to observing. We're always looking for clues to confirm our biases, right? And so one of the things, one of the most loving things you can do is allow them and give them that space to discover things on their own time. But of course, there are things that you can do to influence their decisions. There are things that you can do to and reinforce what they might find just by living as an example, a true example of who you would, who you want to be in their life, right? And eventually, they'll see it. And there's no time on this. It has to be on their time. So I saw it in two years. It took me two years of being rebellious, two years of testing their trust. It took me two years, right? But I know some friends of mine who've adopted and they adopted much younger than 14, right? But it took even a lifetime. You know, their, their children are grown now and they still have not seen it. They still don't trust, right? So everybody goes through these these realizations in their own time. And as a foster parent, as an adoptive parent, it's just a realization that you have to be patient and to really always be rooted in your reason why you did this in the first place. The reason why is what will propel you through. And staying consistent with your behaviors towards that child. Yeah, absolutely. Now, shift, shifting into you, now, how are you able to figure out what you wanted with your life without parental guidance or support in the beginning? Well, like I, like that example that I mentioned earlier when I had that aha moment upstairs in my bedroom, looking out the window, and I said to myself, my education was my ticket to freedom. There's a lot of societal programming that goes on in there. You know, we grow up in elementary school and then in high school, all throughout life in our early childhood, we're programmed by society, by our teachers, by authorities to believe that in order to have a future, you have to go to school, you do well in school, then you get a good job, then you work hard in that job so that you can get more money and then you retire, right? So that is like sort of like a, a, a blueprint, a conventional wisdom blueprint of life, right? Yes. And yeah, I wasn't, I was not exempt to that blueprint. I was not exempt to that wisdom, that conventional wisdom, even though I was an orphan. So I heard it and it had a strong hold on me. So the only way that we're taught how to make money is to go to school and then apply for jobs that are, that are published online. And that was my subscription. You know, that was my programming as well. I'm not immune to that. And so I had that default mode of, okay, I got to go to school. Education was my ticket to freedom. And so I was in that default mode for a long time. And I committed to doing well in school, in high school, so that 
I could get scholarships that would pay for my degrees. And that's exactly what happened. For me, it was do or die. If I don't do this, if I don't get a scholarship, nobody is paying for my education and I'm doomed. That's how I felt. It was literally another life or death situation. It was do or die. And I did. I did. And I got the scholarships. My degree was completely covered uh, with, every year with tuition. I didn't have to pay. It was, it was just, that's how I did it. It was just hard work, resilience, perseverance, and knowing the reason why I was doing it. <laughs> Now, how exactly did you have that mindset of not having money to pay for college and you knew you were going to earn scholarships? Because a lot of times, I mean, just for example, my mother, it's like she is 73 years old. She said she always wanted to go to college. She wanted to become an artist, but she never went to college because her parents couldn't afford it. Now, there are people who might be listening to this and they're like, well, my mom and dad don't have any money, so I can't go to college. But for you, you were able to like, okay, no, I might not have any money to go to college, but I'm going to find ways to do that. How were you able to accomplish that and get that mindset and yes. figure it out? Gotcha. Okay. You see, Johnny, it's funny. Life is funny. We have this notion that we have to see it, then we believe it. You know, you've heard that saying. I mean, your listeners are probably familiar with, I got to see it first, then I'll believe it right? But the laws of the universe, what we call natural law, doesn't work that way, right? You have to believe first and then you can see it, right? And so what, that's what I mean is that you believe, I believed that I was going to go to college. I believed that I was going to have come up with the money. And here's the thing, when you have that energy, when you have that belief, and it's so strong because it's rooted in my why, my un indisputable vision for my future, then you're going to find ways and be resourceful and be creative and innovative and find ways to make it happen. It's like every action you take every day is going to be towards that vision and is going to be moving you closer to that needle. And, he, and, and I strongly believe that it's not about resources. There's never a lack of resources. It's all about resourcefulness, right? When you want something badly enough, when it's do or die, when it's so connected to your vision, you'll make it work, but you have to believe it first and then you'll see it, see the fruits of your actions. One way that works for me anyways is like when you're talking about vision, like I actually create like a movie inside my head and a picture, like for example, I'm the first person in my entire family who's ever gone to college. But it's like I create, created an image in my mind where I could actually see myself walking on stage, having that the president of the university like hand me the, my degree and all that kind of stuff. It's like actually see that. And I, I believe that when we can actually see, we can picture ourselves in that car or in that house or having that degree or whatever it is. You can actually achieve that. You know, for some people, they can't, they can't see themselves ever not having a degree or they can't ever see themselves having kids. And maybe that might be a reason why they don't have that because they can't even visualize it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And you had to try a couple of times, if I remember your story correctly, right? You had to try a couple of times. And then the last time you did it, you got like a 3.8 GPA. Right? Uh, 3.5, 3. but very, very close. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, okay. So you, right? But the first time you tried and it didn't work. Right? You were in college once before and it didn't work. And then the second time you were like, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, right? So you have, that's what I mean. The, the, the game is more of an inner game than it is an outer game. And most people focus on the strategy. What strategy do I got to do? What's the best strategy? And most people look for those tactics and those strategies when they don't realize that it's more of an inner game than an outer game because everything outside of you, you can't control. But the most powerful things are inside, right? And, I, and I, I, when I was reading your story, I thought, wow, that's amazing because you had to overcome the speech impediment as well. You had to overcome your identity of, well, nobody in my family has a college degree, so I don't think I can get a college degree, right? So all of these things are inner game measures, right? And once you overcame it, boom, 3.5 GPA, right? So a lot of these things that when we come across challenges in life, they are about our self-image, right? Our beliefs in our mission, our belief in our competence, self-image. When you overcome that and you connect it with your vision, you can be unstoppable. 
So it's a matter of resourcefulness. It's, it's, never, it's never a lack of resources. It's interesting because our stories are somewhat the same where you didn't have money to go to school. Mm-hmm. So you found a way how to do it. I didn't have parents who could pay for my school at all. So it's like, okay, well, I'm going to bartend while I'm in school. I'm going to take two, three classes at a time. But it's like where some people, well, I'm not going to go to school because I don't have the money or uh, I'm not going to waste my money because I'll probably fail. It's like, no, I'm going to pay $800 to $1,000 per class. And I'm going to get A in this class because I'm paying for it and not wasting my money. Yes. So it's like my whole thing is when you don't have the money to do something and you find a way to do it, you really throw yourself in where I'm going to succeed because I don't have parents who are going to pay for my school. And, you know, someone who's gone to school, some of the kids who I've been in classes with where their parents pay for their education, some of them just don't really care because it's like, well, if I fail, who cares? My parents will allow me to keep on taking these classes over. Yeah, they don't have skin in the game. Yeah, you, in, in our situations, where you don't have a plan B. You, you just have to do this. Yeah, so that's why you and I have skin in the game because we, we funded our way through. We had to be creative in, and innovative in finding ways to do that. Which is very, very empowering. And it's yeah. Just... <laughs> Although at the same, it's empowering, but at the same time, I wouldn't wish it on someone else not to have parents to help support them financially. You know what I mean? I wouldn't wish that on someone else, but at the same time, I see the blessings in that. You know, for everything in life, it's always dualism. It's always dualistic. Nothing is 100% challenging without having support. Nothing is 100% bad with a, without some good to it. You know, and sometimes you don't recognize the positive sides of that pendulum in the moment. But when you get past that, and in retrospect, you look back as hindsight, in hindsight, you see that there was always a balance of the good with the bad. Yeah, well, it makes me think it's like, well, how would things been different? Mm -hmm. Imagine if your parents were around, they paid for you to go to school and all that kind of stuff. How would things been different if I would have had the same thing? You know, would we have found our passion, all that kind of stuff? Because literally, I believe every single thing that happens to us, as hard as as challenging it might be, it happens for a reason because we wouldn't be where we are today. Yeah. Absolutely. I love what you said there, Johnny, because it's all about looking back. And we can only connect the dots looking backwards. And when we connect the dots and we realize and we acknowledge the benefits it's given us, all those hardships, all those hard times, the darkest moments of our life, the purpose they serve to where we're at now, that's when we can truly appreciate them. And I hear it. I mean, you've done the work. I've done the work in acknowledging those things. And that's what really empowers us right now and into the future. Yes. So speaking of education, with the costs of education continually to increase, do you think formal education is worth getting in terms of getting a career that pays well in a competitive job market? Right. So whether or not college degrees are worth it or not, you can't make a blanket statement like that. You have to ask yourself and have clarity on what are your career goals. What does a professional future look like for you? What are things that you value in your future? And then you reverse engineer. Do I need a college education? Do I need a degree to achieve that? And sometimes the answer is yes. For example, if you want to be an accountant or if you want to be a physician, right, or a lawyer, you do need a college degree for that because those are professional, those are professions and you do need a degree. So the answer is yes, a degree is worth it. No, but if you want to be in healthcare, there are positions, there's many positions in healthcare where you don't need a four year degree, right? So that's what I mean. It all depends on having clarity on the things you want for your life and being able to envision for yourself what is a fulfilling future like for me. It doesn't mean you have to get it right. You don't have to be bang on, right? But you're making the best decision with the information you have now by having a greater form of self-awareness and being and acknowledging the path you've been on right now and looking at your current skill stack and trying to decide for yourself, what skills do I need to develop to get the things I want in my life? Because most of the time, you don't need a four-year degree to get them. 
So then if you're still feeling, so then, then if you're still feeling, well, I, I, I feel, still think I should go to school. Maybe I should still go to school. Then you got to really, really get brutally honest with yourself. Is it an ego choice? feeling that getting a degree would raise my status or is it because I still society still has a strong hold on me and I feel like I would not be worthwhile or not smart if I don't have a degree you know so it's a, it, you have to be brutally honest with yourself and be honest about what are the reasons what's the real reason I mean the real reason why you still feel like you want to go to college my experience especially with interviewing dozens of people is I feel sometimes you need to go to school to do something to figure out that that's not what you want to do. And why I say this, like one lady who I interviewed, she went to school to become a lawyer. She became a corporate lawyer, made a lot of money, 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 money. And that was her whole intention to go to school to become a lawyer because she knew lawyers made tons of money. And then she realized, I hate being a corporate lawyer. It was the worst thing I've ever done. But she had to go through that experience, she had to go to school to become a lawyer to realize, I don't want to do this. I actually want to be a coach and work with women. Yeah. So um, for, for somebody who's listening to this, who's like thinking, oh, I need to go to school because my mom and dad want me to go to school. You know, what, what exactly should they do? Right. So there's that as well. That's a perspective. We're looking back on it, you know, as after my PhD, I'm not in research. I'm not a professor right now either. So I didn't quote unquote, use my degree the way it was intended for lack of a better term, right? But if you are unsure of what you want, if, and, and you're young, you know, you're, you're, you're young and you're unsure of what you want, or you kind of ha have a wide variety of interests and you don't know which one to focus on, it's okay to go to school. I'm not, I'm not anti-college. I'm not anti-degree. What I'm saying is that you have to be clear on the reasons why you're choosing what you want, what you're choosing. If going to college is something that you you find leverages your strengths, for example, if you if you really have a value on education, you place a value on education and having an academic experience as an exploratory environment, then go for it, right? But you have to be realistic of the downfalls of that as well. For example, will you be in a certain amount of debt? You know, for example, will, will you thrive in an academic environment? So, so those are some considerations before you choose that type of environment to do exploration. Because there's many other ways outside of a four-year degree that you could do to explore and try things on that don't cost as much or that don't that leave you in a classroom that you feel you're, that's not your, not your strong suit. You know what I mean? So there's so many different ways to try things on. It's just about being creative and taking a little bit of risk, calculated risk, but um, going outside of your comfort zone, saying yes to things, saying yes to meeting new people, going on interview, information interviews, meeting people who are established, who have a life that you want, and just kind of having a conversation with them. Those are ways that are equally as effective for exploring options as going to school, right? So it's, it doesn't have to be the default anymore. That's, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, well, the big thing is you have to be willing to ask people for support because sometimes we get in that mindset where, uh, you know, you, you, you admire somebody, but you don't want to ask because you think they're going to say no or something. Yeah, fear of rejection is a big one. I do get that a lot with my clients that they fear the rejection. But here's the thing. You can't get yes all the time, right? So the way to look at rejection, I would say, is how many no's do you need to get before you get to that yes? So if you get a no, then the, then the mindset shift is, oh, yes, I'm one step closer to the yes because I got a no already. Then you get your second no. Okay, I'm another step closer to getting a yes. Eventually, it's going to be a yes, right? And the no's, the failures, you know, people fear failure. They feel rejection. The failures and the rejections are built-in features. They're built-in features of a life journey. That's all they are. They're just features. They're not setbacks, right? They're feedback mechanisms. Right, so when you look at it that way, things aren't as scary as we make them out to be. And our brains tend to 
complicate things, you know. And I love that that the the fallacy of Occam's razor. Sometimes the most simplest, sometimes the simplest solution is the solution. But we kind of kind of have a bias in thinking that the most complicated thing is going to be the solution to our problems when it is actually the most simplest thing that's right in front of us. Right. So that's what I would say there. Now, how how do you get all that? the negativity and stuff. I was, I was interviewing somebody and they were sharing, it's like the average person, I think she said something like 8,000, 9,000 negative thoughts in your head that people go through every single day. How, how do you just get rid of all that and get to really focus on things? Right. I can appreciate that. I, I think I've heard that statistic somewhere, but you know, I have to say that the highest, and I've, and I've spent a lot of time studying the lives of the ultra successful, the ultra rich, you know, the Elon Musk, the Jeff Bezos, the Steve Jobs of the world. I've, I've, I've studied them. I've studied the way they think, the way they carry out their days. They have negative thoughts too, but the negative thoughts they have are of a different nature. They're meaningful. Right? They're worried about not being of service. They're worried about um, building systems and structures that serve the world. You know what I mean? So if the negative thoughts are holding you back, if all hundred of them are holding you back in your day, there's no way that you can get rid of them. The brain doesn't work that way. But what you can do is replace them. Just like a bad habit, good habit. You don't get rid of bad habits. You replace them with good habits. Right? And, and you get bigger problems. You get, you, you get better problems in your life, right? So chances are, if you're struggling with all 100 negative thoughts every day that go in your mind, and these negative thoughts are limiting you, and they are social qualms that you're struggling with, if you, if you choose bigger and better problems in your life to worry about, then you will replace all those little ones that are niggering and that are holding you back. And you are deliberately, intentionally, and you can design this, you can put problems in your life that are meaningful to solve that when you solve them, raise you up and you become a bigger and better version of yourself, right? So that's what I mean about being intentional with growing up, being intentional intentional about personal development. That's one way to do it. Yeah, and I think when you have that thought calm your mind, it's like, okay, so for example, you reach out to somebody to do like say a podcast interview and you're thinking, okay, this person's going to probably say no. You're like, okay. Is this really true? Did the person already say that they're not interested? No, they never said that. Okay, so let me do this anyways. Because a lot of times we think that someone's going to say no to something, but they didn't say no. So we don't even try to do it. Like, for example, I I reach out to this one lady who went to Yale and I'm like, I didn't go to Yale. She went to Ivy League school. Why would she want to come on my podcast? And I reach out to her and she's like, oh my God, I would love to come on your podcast. I've never done one before. I'm like, wow, actually by me reaching out to her, it helped her, it, her horizon, because she never done something. It's like, this is a new skill set for her. So a lot lot of times, yeah, when we get stuck in a mindset where we don't think we can do something, just do it anyways. (laughs) I love what you said there. It's true. (laughs) Sometimes our lower self gets in the way and we already see the no, we already reject ourselves before we take action. But here's the thing though, I mean, sometimes, I, sometimes it's lower self. Sometimes we just don't want to bother the other person because we don't want to ask for help because we don't want to intrude, right? And, but here's the thing. When you ask for help, it's actually a very noble thing because human beings love to have a purpose. We seek purpose. We are purpose-seeking machines. And so when you are asking someone for help and they are both willing and able to help, they actually are serving their purpose in helping you. Right? So you're actually helping them serve their purpose. Right? So it's actually very noble and it's a very courageous thing to ask for help. Right? And the other thing is, say you do ask for someone's help and they actually do say no. The other problem that people come into is they take it personally. Right? It must be me. They don't like me. I'm not good enough. Right? So that's a me. They, they take it personally. And so that's the other side of the coin as well. Actually, when you do have that courage, you step up and ask and you get a no you know, to resist that taking it personally part of it because there's so many reasons. There's a multitude of reasons why someone could say no to you and it could have nothing, usually it has nothing to do with you, right? So that's what I would say about that. <laughs> well, and that's why I said don't take things personally either. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, because I was listening to one of Dan Locke's interviews, and he was talking to a gentleman who does uh, cold calling, and he's like, every single day he'd call 300 people, and most of the time he'd get rejected, but he's so glad he did that, because had he not done that, he wouldn't be as good as he is today, and now he's literally one of the best sales people in the world. So you have to really put yourself in these uncomfortable situations to really, to really grow. Yes, absolutely. All those analogies of diamonds coming, becoming diamonds because of stress and pressure. You know, it's really true. And we can learn a lot just by looking at nature. Yeah. Now, with your own career, what are some things that you overcome in pursuing your own dreams? I had to come overcome a lot of the self-image is- issues that, that really stemmed from early in life. You know, I had to go through the whole feelings of unworthiness, be, being unwanted, um, being the unpopular one, all of those self-image uh, issues had to, I really had to put this to rest before I felt worthwhile or before I felt capable of stepping into my purpose. And for me, school was a default because of reprogramming since early childhood and because of my particular circumstances where I had to get out of a bad situation. And really school was my safe haven. It was the way that I got out of it. Because of scholarships, I was able to move to the city of my choosing. But with the scholarship, they even gave me an airplane ticket. So really it saved my life. I, so that's what I mean. It has been such a, that association with school as my savior, put it in a default mode. And I, and I, really didn't know how to handle decisions on career. And I didn't know how to think about what's important to me. You know, I didn't think, I didn't know how to think about who I am, like, who am I? And what is my contribution in this world? What's my purpose in this world? Those were a lot of things that I had to figure out the hard way. I had to figure these out. And the education system doesn't train you. It doesn't teach you how to do that. And I, and I found that out the hard way too. (laughs) Now, going to school, you had scholarships, so they pretty much paid for everything? Yeah, they paid. Yes, they did, except for the one year. uh, So I did my master's degree in the UK, and I was not eligible for the scholarships I applied for because I don't have citizenship, like European citizenship, or I don't live, I'm not from the UK. So I didn't qualify. So that was the only year where I had to get student loans. And I, I did. I had a student loan there. And because I was taking the student loan internationally, they did not cover a lot. They didn't give me a lot of loans. And so I summed up all the cash that I had and I realized, oh gosh, I only can afford one year of college. So I told myself, okay, that's it. I got to finish in one year and come back. (laughs) So that was another do or die. The second do or die moment I had, I have enough, I have enough money only for one year of college. Okay. Then I have to finish my master's degree in one year. (laughs) So, so going through getting scholarships and stuff, what, what, what are some tips that you have? Because some people don't even know that there are scholarships even out there. Oh, they're everywhere. They are just everywhere. So the most common place that people look is within the institution, right? In the department, in the institution, in the faculty, they have scholarships and they're on the university's websites. But when you really get creative, there are philanthropists that offer scholarships because of, in memory of a loved one or, you know me, our cause that they're fighting for, sometimes they have, they offer scholarships and they give them to well, well-informed well and very intelligent students. And so I found scholarships like that. I applied for those. Some banks offer scholarships to students in certain areas. They say, if you are interested in a degree like that, our bank will offer a scholarship. I mean, it's not a lot of money, but it's, it could be a couple thousand dollars. That's a semester right there, <laughs> right? So they're, they're really everywhere. And like I said, it's not about resources. It's always about resourcefulness. So you just have to be just like, like stuck on it and you just have to be all in and do whatever it takes. Yeah, well, one thing that's really beautiful too is when you say you're going to do something, you have those expect, expectations out there and you know you're going to do this. It's like doors literally just open up and it's like all these opportunities just start coming in and it just, it happens. Yes. I, I love the way you described it. And, and I, just to stack on top of that too, sometimes a door opens, an opportunity comes to you 
but you don't recognize it as one. And the reason why is because sometimes when these opportunities come, you you kind of like have a, you already have an expectation of what an opportunity looks like. So you kind of like, you're judging the form it presents itself. And life doesn't work that way. Sometimes another opportunity comes at your door and it looks different from what you expected. So then you kind of just don't see it or you ignore it or you say, oh no, that's not what I wanted or that's not a good opportunity. But that's what I mean is that when you go through life and you get, and you purposely and strategically gather more experiences, what you're really doing is building up mental representations of different things. And when you start to recognize patterns, you start to quickly see opportunities in places where you couldn't see them before, right? So that's what, that's what I'll say about that. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> so for someone who's listening right now who grew up in poverty, mm -hmm. has a family history of repeated cycles, what advice do you have for them to break out of it? Because just for example, it's amazing to me how you can have two people, one person grows up in poverty, they never have anything and they just blossom and their whole life transforms. And another person, they kind of go through the same situation, but they just stay stuck. How is that one person able to do that where the other person just doesn't? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of psychology research about it. Even in my field in neuroscience, there's a lot of studies on you know, twins that are separated. And then, you know, does environment, is it environment? Is it nature versus nurture? There's so many studies about that. And like many things in science, it's really hard to get unanimity, right? It's hard to have a hundred percent agreement between studies and studies are, con are conducted differently, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So all I can really say is from my professional standpoint, you know, and also from my experiences and experiences in my world of talking to other people as well. And of course, I don't have the bandwidth to talk to everyone in this world who's grown up in poverty and then came, went on to become successful or not and did the comparisons, right? I can't, it's not possible for one person to have the 100% the representation. But what, can I, what I can say is this, if I were to give one piece of advice, this is what I would say, is that the past does not predict the future. It doesn't. And you are not your family's history. You are not your past, right? In the beginning, the first, I would say, and this is a very generalized statement, the first 18 years, because I'm more like I'm, I'm in North America and that's kind of like 18 years. is kind of like the brink of adulthood. That's how we define it, right? But I'm, so I'm going to say 18 loosely, but for the first 18 years of your life, you limit, you have a limited choices, you know, because you live with your parents, they, you're living under their roof, and they kind of make the decisions for you, right? And you are also trying to gain uh, knowledge, experience, gain skills to make decisions and to, to recognize patterns in life and in the universe to make good decisions, right? So your, your, your decisions are limited because you're, you haven't become the person to be able to make more complex decisions yet. But this funny thing happens, and then you are off to college or you're 18 and you graduate and you leave home, whatever that next step is for you, all of a sudden we're cast into this world, this what quote unquote, the real world, right? And we're expected to go and make something of your life, right? And that's the expectation. Go and make something, do something with your life, make something of your life. And then all of a sudden, everybody, for everybody, it shows up differently, but there's this now what? There's this huge now what? face that we put on, right? <laughs> right. But the, the thing that I would say is that your past does not dictate the future. You are now, you've become, you've unbecome a child. You've unbecome the needs of a child. You've unbecome the dependencies of a child. And now you have, you are an adult and you are fully capable. So it's about taking ownership of your capabilities, of your new competencies and accepting that you're going to make mistakes. But the past mistakes, the mistakes of your parents, the mistakes of your ancestors don't necessarily mean that they're yours. Right? And a lot of people are stuck and they're and and they're they haven't reached the success or the the fortitude that they desire because they they extend that family history into their life. And they kind of look at the history of their family and they kind of feel doomed that this is going to repeat itself in some way, shape or form. And that's nothing I can do about it. You know, so what I'm saying, I would like to impress upon 
your listeners is that that is not true because one of the most, the most powerful thing that you have is that you have control of your thoughts and your actions. And that changes, that changes the course of your life. That alone, taking ownership of that and acknowledging that fully changes the course of your life in all areas of your life, not just your career, but your family as well, your financial future, your, fam- your social, your intelligence, your spiritual future. That is where it starts, is with you. It doesn't start before you were born or, or during your childhood. It starts with you. And, that's, and that moment where you realize that is something I call your moment of agency, right? When I, your moment of, and it happens a different year for everyone, right? For, for me, it happened when I was 16. But every, everyone is different. Some people have their moment of agency when they're a bit older or younger or much older. Right? And, and, and you're not to judge that. Who is to judge when you're supposed to have that moment, right? But um, it happens for everyone for different reasons. Yeah, you just have to have the burning desire. So I, I, was, I was thinking about this. It seems like this generation, so like, let's say past 30, 40 years, is so different from the way it used to be. Like, for example, my father and my grandfather and probably his grandfather, they always used to spank their kids and, you know, yell at them and do all this, all this negative reinforcement, which just didn't work. And it seems like our generation that we have now is really breaking through all these different negative and toxic cycles. And there's some people who still don't break break through it. Like I, I have a good friend of mine, uh, I should say childhood friend of mine, and his parents had three kids, no, four kids. He has three sisters and then himself. And growing up in the Midwest, a lot of people, their parents were farmers or factory workers. And it's like, you have a father, he worked in a factory, and then you work in a factory. And when you have kids, your kids will work in a factory and everyone in your family worked in a factory. Like, it's, it's amazing to me how some people are able to break through that. And they're like, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that. They move. They go to a different country where some people, their mindset never changes. And they continue that repeated toxic cycle over and over and over. And I always just wonder, it's like, why, why don't some people just like, you know what? I'm not going to be like my parents. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, Johnny. And, and I have to say, though, that I went through that, too. Now, I was young when that happened, but I, I had those cycles. I felt like I, I had no control of my life and what my family's history, what was my childhood as a homeless, unwanted orphan. I felt that that was going to be my future, too. And like, I'm not, look, we're not to judge that individuals who are in those you know, are, 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 haven't moved past it or, or overcome them. But sometimes it takes a third person, a very, a, a very insightful, um, truthful, honest person who loves them enough to come into their life and speak the truth so that they can hear it in a way that they can understand. Sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. And, and we're afraid to do that. We're afraid to be that person to rock the boat. We're afraid to be the person to tell the truth because we want to be liked. We want to be respected. And we feel that if we're honest or too honest, that we're going to hurt feelings and therefore we will lose a relationship or we will lose love and lose lose acceptance. Right. And so that's what I mean. And unfortunately, not everybody has someone like that in their life that will come in and just speak the truth to them in a way that they can understand it. And if, in, if the first time doesn't work, that they will tirelessly find a way that, w- that they will understand it. Because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And that's the thing. You don't know what you don't know. And that for the, to the person who's still in that, they don't know what they don't know. And the way that they move that into the next level of awareness is when they know what they don't know so it takes a, a somebody to tell them lovingly but very honestly and that's one thing that i absolutely love about podcasts because if you grew up in a i would say dysfunctional family i can only speak for myself i grew up in a very dysfunctional family where i didn't have mentors and all that kind of stuff it's beautiful that now we can listen to podcasts of all these amazing people who've been through everything and we can learn so much from those people. 
Yeah. So that's why I feel that, I mean, the name of your podcast, you know, the power of your voice is, is really, really important. And I think that you must have really careful, took a lot of care to select a name like that, right? Because sometimes we neglect our own voices and we don't feel that we have one. And for whatever reason that happened, an event in the past that feel, you felt like that robbed you of your voice, right? A podcast, when you listen to someone, someone else's story, it, it's a way that you can give yourself back that permission to have a voice and to awaken it back inside of you, right? a permission to be successful and to be unapologetic about it, or permission to explore things that you've never done before, knowing that someone else has done it successfully and failed and done it successfully, and therefore you can do it too. So whatever that permission is, the power of your voice, right? It's like, okay, now you have permission, go and make something of your life and trust that things will turn out you know, so long as you're so long as you are true to yourself so long as you are honoring your purpose and so long as you are respecting others and being kind to others in the process yeah and that all comes down to being vulnerable being responsible being authentic it does yeah so speaking of voice so dr grace you are a motivational speaker informative speaker you host career revisionist show and you've been on stage of Dan Locke? <laughs> yes, I have, yeah. yeah. And then last week, I heard you in front of 1,500 people, which is amazing. When did you discover your own voice? It was a couple of years ago. It was actually towards the end of my PhD. And I will reveal a secret, a deep secret to you and your listeners. The one thing I was really insecure about growing up was the sound of my own voice. I hated the sound of it. What? So that's what I, yeah, I was so insecure about the way it sounded that I, every time I spoke, I just cringed. I hated it. You have a great voice. I didn't believe that. And for a long time, that was my story to myself was that I sounded terrible. Right. And it wasn't until the, towards the end of my PhD, what happened was I had another rude awakening when I started to really experience and realize the gaps and limitations of formal education. And it, I, I took it upon myself, a, a new mission to close that gap, right? So that's where I started to organize seminars. I started to do some, you know, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. I started to do, put together workshops all about careers, how to navigate careers, how to decide on a career, how to um, use your PhD. What are some creative ways that we could rise up and advance our, our careers? All of that was, was in there. I even talked about, you know, financial management, all of these topics that the schools were not teaching us. And that itself was the first foray into public speaking when I started doing that. And I didn't even think, and in the moment, I was so passionate about that. I needed to close the gap, the educational gap. I was so passionate about that mission that I had forgotten about my insecurity, about hating the sound of my voice. <laughs> wow. So you did, did you take like Toastmasters or something? Nope. Wow. No, not at all. Not at all. That's what I'm saying is that when you, when you take on bigger and better problems in your life, for me, the bigger and better problem was there's a gap in the education system. People are buying into it because they're told you got to go to school and get a good job. And that's the only way to get a good job. And people are buying into that, but they're not taught in school the more important skills of navigating through life. That was a huge problem that I took on and it was a better problem. And so that's what I mean. You start to forget. You start to get the other problems that hold you back. The other problem that held me back was, I hate the sound of my voice. I don't want to speak. Poor me, poor me. You know, that was the, my previous problem. So when I accepted a bigger and better problem, all of a sudden, those other ones, all that negativity is not even, it's not even applicable anymore. Right? Because I want to fulfill my mission. And with fulfilling the mission comes other challenges I have to overcome. And when you speak your truth and you do something you're very passionate about, mm -hmm. as what you do... It's amazing how that really, really comes out. And people can feel that. They can sense that. They can. And that's why I help people now to find their purpose. Yeah, because by watching your videos on YouTube, I'm like, my gosh, she's a really good speaker. Your voice is very calm, very soothing. You're very passionate about everything that you talk about and your face suggestions, all that. It's like it really, really comes out. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
You're welcome. And of course, you just have to ask, how, how was that being on the stage, Dan Locke? I'm like, that must have been incredible. It, it, it was. It was not my first time on stage, so it wasn't like that. It wasn't a breaking moment. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because it wasn't my first time on stage. <laughs> it wasn't the first time on stage, and it wasn't um, the first time on stage with that size of an audience either, right? So it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a first. But I have to say, though, um, I, I was definitely very honored just to be on Dan's stage and to talk to his mentees and his and that community as well, and just to see and to be a part of his movement, his global movement, was incredible. And I have such a, a huge respect for Dan. He's a friend of mine. We're both from the same city, and we've done other work together as well. And you know, and I'm a part of his movement as well. So it's just been an amazing experience just to see him grow and to see his service to other people. Well, the beautiful thing about podcasts, Natalie Jill, she interviewed Dan Locks a while ago, just okay. a couple of weeks ago. And the amazing thing is when we have podcasts, we listen to other podcasts and other people inspire us. And then you listen to someone's interview and then you listen, you start listening to their podcasts. It's like, it's amazing how all this big community is just really remarkable. It's beautiful. And we can all inspire and learn so much from each other. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it is so true. It is so true. And, you know, you never, you never do stop learning and edu formal education is just one way to learn, but there's this whole vast world out there called self-education. And that is, that is just a, a gift, right? That you can give yourself that keeps giving, right? So being, being in, being in the presence of people like Dan Locke and other speakers as well and other, you know, other business owners and other thought leaders is one way that you can really try things on and to figure out for yourself your, your career path in, in, in moving forward, right? That's one way to do it. But there's, that's what I mean. It's like there's so many ways that you could do to figure it out. And school is no longer the default anymore. You can't learn this stuff by going to school. It's like uh, listen to podcasts and all that kind of stuff. The things you gain from that is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> But the, the, the big thing is, is we need to give our permission, uh, give ourselves permission to fail because it's like, okay, so you're standing on a stage speaking in front of 1500 people, but some people are like, well, I wish I could go in front of 1500 people maybe, but if they haven't been on a stage with five people, you don't want to put yourself in that kind of situation because you're not going to really prepare yourself. And it's like, you know, we have to go through all these amazing learning experiences make mistakes so we can continue to grow. And the reason why I say this, like I remember when I first did my podcast, the first time I did it, I forgot to hit record. Oh. And then the next time I did it, I had my phone on and I had all these noises and oh my gosh. And then I had one thing where I, I didn't write enough questions. I only did three questions. And then the person's like, don't worry about it. We'll do it tomorrow. Let's do like 10 questions. I challenge you to write more questions. And it's like, we have to go through all these different experiences to continue to get better. Did you document your journey along the way? What's that? Did you document your journey? No, <laughs> but I need to talk about this on a podcast episode. Yeah. So I'm going to re record one of myself talking about that because I think that could be very beneficial to other people. Yeah. We, we, we sometimes want to be at the very top. But it's actually better to start in the bottom and work our way up so we can learn through those mistakes because otherwise we would be stuck. And I'd rather make mistakes in the beginning than make them towards the end. Exactly. Because, you know, I mean, success is never one event. We see successful people and we just think that they've always been like that, right? And, it, and something happened and overnight they're successful and then boom, that's it, right? But it doesn't happen that way. Even Jeff Bezos had really humble beginnings, you know, and so did Steve Jobs. He, he failed so many times and we don't see those failures because that's not what the media loves to portray. We just see the glory of success and what wealth brings. We see all that glory and we think that where's our one moment, where's our break? And we're looking for the break when it isn't like that. It's a process, isn't it? Yeah. And whether it takes five years, 10 years, 20 years, the most important thing is you just do not give up. Just keep on going. <laughs> so I w wanted to ask you, what's like your daily routine when you get up in the morning? Like, what do you do? It differs every morning. 
It differs every morning. Well, I set my own schedule because I work for myself. Uh, I have to say I'm not a I'm not an extremely early morning person. Yeah, so I'm not like up with the birds kind of thing or anything like that. But uh, I'd say on average, it's like I'm sometimes I have to get up at 630 for meetings with people across the other side of the globe. And then that's fine, too. But I would say on average in my mornings, you know, I like to have some quiet time to myself. That's where I do some thinking, um, not the deepest thinking, right, but some thinking, some planning. And I do what I call the big three. And what that is, is in the first thing in the morning, I ask myself, what is my big three? And the big three are three actions, you know, the thing, accomplishments that I want to have done before I go to bed that this night, before I go to bed tonight. And those three things, they're big things. In other words, if I, when I get, when I knock those three down, they're going to really move the needle towards my ultimate goal. Right. So every day there's a big three and then I just hear them. Yeah. They're different. Every day is different. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's different every day, (laughs) but you can, I I have to decide what the big three is going to be for me today. And sometimes it's contextual, you know, depending on uh, other things you have scheduled. Sometimes there's a big meeting or a negotiation happening or something like that. So it's a big three, but no matter what it is, all those, the big threes are always aligned to the ultimate vision and they're to move you closer to that goal and move you closer. I like that. And the good thing about that is you're not on autopilot because a lot of times for probably a majority of people working nine to fives, wake up in the morning, eat the same cereal, maybe read a newspaper, check social media, go to work, come home, make dinner, feed the kids, do this, but like they continue to do the same thing, but you're constantly always changing things. I am. And I don't, it's not that a hundred percent. I do. I change things deliberately, you know, things in business, if you're a business owner, things are very dynamic. They're always moving because the marketplace is always changing. So that you have to just move with it and you kind of have to just flow with it. So in part it's choice, but the other part is also because that's the way business ownership is. And you have to, as CEO, you know, you just have to pivot. (laughs) So that's the other part of it. And that's me being honest. I like that. And then like, who are the types of people you surround yourself with? Because that's so incredibly important. Yeah. So I am so grateful to say that I have, I have people in my life who are much smarter than me. They're more successful than me. They're more established than me. They are just amazing thought leaders. They are mentors to many. Um, They are, they have, each of them have a certain type of success or certain success in a certain area that I desire for my life. Right? And so it's really cool to be in community with them where you have conversations that aren't quote unquote normal. <laughs> They're not normal conversations, but we, we get each other you know, because we're both, we're all ambitious. We're all wanting to change the world in, in our own ways. Right? So it's, I've always had this notion where I never got to choose my relatives, you know, the relatives that didn't want me in their life in the past. Right. I didn't get to choose those. I, you're born into that family, right? Blood relatives, you, you can't choose those. But you can certainly choose your friends. And you can choose friends that later become family to you, right? Because relatives is default. You can't choose that. But family is a relationship that is a choice, right? So this has always been my, my motto. And I've lived by that. So all, all my life through, you know, college, university, through adulthood, Uh, that's been something I've always lived by is that I get to choose my family because a family is a relationship and relationships are intentional. So I'm building, I'm constantly building my family. (laughs) Yeah. That's what I would say. And the beautiful thing is, yeah, you get to surround yourself with people who love you, appreciate you. And, you know, they really, really want the best in you and, and in your life and everything. Yeah. But it's also not blindly just taking people who will always just support me. I also need people to challenge me too. Very much. Yes. Yeah. And that aren't afraid to say no, or that aren't afraid to point out something that I need to hear, even though it's hard for me to hear. Yeah. Like I, I, I have to have people like that in my life too. Yeah. yeah. Cause you, we can't grow. Yeah. Yeah. It's what I, it's something called an echo chamber. No, I don't want to, 
you know, the, the worst thing is if you choose friends in your life or you surround yourself and then all of you without unbeknownst to you, you form an echo chamber. You know, that is, <laughs> that would be one of the worst things I would think. <laughs> yeah. If everybody agrees with every single thing that you say, yeah. How are you supposed to grow? <laughs> exactly. Now, for those listening to this podcast, what, what are three main things that you'd really love for people to take away from this interview? Three main things about business, about life, or? About anything, anything that you really think that's very important. Right. Um, I would say one of them, which well, the one I mentioned earlier, is that you know, you, your, your past does not define your future. Right? It really does not define your future. You define your future. Right. So there's that identity piece to it. Right. And the second thing is that if you look for clues in nature, everything in all the other living creatures on Earth, they have these really amazing bodies. You know, some of them camouflage. Some of them have these eyelids that are UV protection. Some of them, if you cut off their limbs, they regrow their limbs. You know, some, some of them run super fast or jump super high or they have really sharp teeth. You know what I mean? So all of these living creatures have something physical about them that's just incredible and it, and it allows them to thrive in this world. Human beings don't. Our bodies are fragile. From an engineering perspective, we would say that some of our joints are designed poorly. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. We we can't we we can't protect ourselves without the tools that we build. You know, we're so fragile. But there's one thing that we have above all animals that is super powerful, and that's our mind. So if you take the clue from nature, is that the purpose of life is to grow. Everything grows, from baby, adolescent to childhood, from plants, a seed to a full blown tree, etc. It's about growth. So one thing that can grow better than anything else in this world is our mind. And when we grow our mind, it becomes so powerful because everything outside of us, we can't control. And the one thing we can is us. There must be a reason why. Right? So that's the second thing. And the third thing I would say to your listeners is that success is a very elusive term. Everybody wants to be successful and the things that we strive for in life, the things that we gruel over, work hard, longer hours, go to school, try to get straight A's, all of these things is because we want to be successful. But sometimes we just say we want to be successful, but it, we would do better if we defined for ourselves what success looks like. And it makes it easier because when you define it and you, and you know for yourself so clear about what success looks like for you, then you'll realize that some of the things that you're grueling over right now aren't necessary to achieve that success, <laughs> you know? And so that's why I would say that clarity, having clarity of direction and clarity of purpose really comes, is very paramount in the process. And, you know, that's very paramount, paramount in the process. And to believe, and once you have that clarity, to believe in the mission and in yourself. That's good. Mm -hmm. just want to ask you going back when you were nine ten years old is there anything you would say to that young grace who was probably really scared and just had no idea how the world was going to be and how life would turn out is there anything you would tell her oh there's so many things i would tell her <laughs> <laughs> what's just a couple <laughs> how about you how about just a simple, I love you, or you are loved? That goes a long way. Yes. Right? But for someone in my particular situation, because I felt unloved, that's, that's what I mean. For some other people, it's something else. It's, it's different, right? So for me, I would, that would be a very paramount, paramount thing to say to younger me is, you are loved. I love you, you know? Um, and another one would be, it gets better from here. You know, because when you are at a point in your life that's so low, I was rock bottom. I was suicidal. You know, uh, then at that young age? Yeah. Yeah. When I said I gave up, I gave up on life, I really mean I gave up on life. I was. I really felt like it's hopeless. I could just die right now and no one would know and no one would care. So I was. That's a scary place to be. 
it was a really scary place to be. I tried it you know, a couple of times and it, and you just wake up feeling even worse, you know, but so that's what I mean. I, I would tell myself, you are loved, you're worthy. You know, you are worthy. You're, you're, it gets better from here. It's better from here. Um, that anything that I can impart some hope, because when you lose hope, and that's where you, all of these other thoughts seep in, is when you lose that hope and you lose that belief. Yeah, you just have to know it's going to get better. Yeah. Just don't give up. Yeah. But seeing is not believing. A lot of it is on faith. You know, you believe it first. You envision what that future looks like, that success looked like, and then it happens. Right? So the sequence is very important. But first you have to you have to take actions to unbecome. Yeah. Yeah, because if you're just thinking and you don't take action, it's not going to happen. Yeah, exactly. So for anyone who's listening to this right now, Dr. Grace, how can people find you on the internet? How can they find you on social media? How can they book you for public speaking? How can they find your podcast, find you on YouTube? So everything is on my website. My, my company is called Mastery Insights. With, it's plural, Mastery Insights. So it's the, the website is masteryinsights.com. My movement, so I, I'm, also, I'm also starting a, a global movement of empowered to empower professionals, you know, where I teach them how to achieve vocational confidence, where they can grow, where they can master their, their destinies, where they can design their future and build, advance their careers, right? So that is my movement, my, my movement. And the movement is called Career Revisionist. So there's a website there too called, you know, careerrevisionist.com. My podcast is also Career Revisionist Podcast. <laughs> so that's my podcast and everything is on my website. If you want to get a hold of me, if your listeners want to get a hold of me, all of my social links are on those various websites too. Great. And I will post everything in the blog so people can reach out to you. Well, thank you so very much for your time, Dr. Grace. I really, really, really appreciate you being here on the Power of Your Voice podcast my pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Johnny here. Thank you for listening to the Power Your Voice podcast. I'd love to get your feedback on this episode and how it impacted you. If someone in your life could benefit from this episode, share it with them. Check out thepoweryourvoice.com to read show notes, leave a comment on the blog page, and to stay updated on all future episodes, subscribe to this podcast and leave a five-star review. Thank you for your love and support.